We are fortunate to have Dr. Silberstein here from Jefferson to speak to us about his remarkable and ongoing career in the field of headache. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming along and doing this interview for the American Headache Society. First of all, I hear you were born here in Philadelphia. You grew up here. You attended Jefferson University. Tell me about that and your neurology background. I grew up in Philadelphia. Yeah. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania for all of my training. Yes. And I was able to uh, spend three years at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, between the time I finished my second year of residency in medicine and starting my neurology residency. So you did some medicine before you went into neurology? In the old days. You did. In the old days, you were required to do two years of medicine. Yes. Before you could become a neurologist. Yeah, I, I recall that myself. So you've been involved for years with the American Headache Society, and this was formerly called the American Association for the Study of Headache. You're the president of uh, this society in the past. What is your view of the history of the organization over your career? I think over the years we've become central and extremely important to the entire world of headache neurology. Um, we are now partners with any organization that's writing guidelines for headache yes. and for accreditation. So now these are the place because there are people look to us for guidance in the world of headache. Yeah, and I'm on the education chair of the International Headache Society, and there's no question the American Headache Society is a leader in education and scientific work throughout the world. Um, your talks are of great interest. Uh, you deliver knowledge about headache and related disorders in a straightforward and very frank manner. It's obvious that you have enjoyed your career and have had remarkable contributions. Tell us about the, your trajectory in the headache field. It's a long story. I was at the National Institute of Health doing basic research mm -hmm. and our Sunday night dates I used to go to the lab and kill rats and yeah. I was looking at model, in vitro models of re -innervation. I worked in a great lab with Erwin Copen and Julie Axelrod who won the Nobel Prize but my wife made the observation the only day of the week I came home happy is when I went to a free clinic and saw patients. Oh. So it was fairly obvious to me that oh, I love science that I got greater pleasure out of taking care of patients. And then when I finished my residency, I went into general neurological practice. Mm -hmm. And while in general neurological practice, I found a need to take care of patients in the city from nobody else could take care of them. There was nobody else in the city I could refer a headache patient to. So you, you took this on as something you like to do and became very good at it. Well, basically in part, my wife pushed me into it yeah. because she was working for a company and couldn't find anybody to speak for a headache. And I went and spoke for her. And actually that article was published in the Old Green Journal. We, we could call her the good wife. That's the good wife is exactly <laughs> correct. And then, and then from there it went, and what another boost in the career was that about the time I was getting started, the age of the triptans began and mm -hmm. that required more sites to do clinical trials. And that's how we got involved in clinical research and then by accident, I became the editor of Wolf's Headache while in private practice. And then a number of years later, the opportunity came to move lock, stock, and barrel to Thomas Jefferson University, which gave us the opportunity to do more things academic. Could we start? I, I understood you spent maybe time as a student or resident a little bit at Queen Square in London. Oh, yeah. And did One, you meet uh, McDonald Critchley oh, yeah. and Tell people you the stories. like that? When I was a medicine resident. Yes. I convinced the Department of Medicine to let me spend time doing neurology. Mm -hmm. And then I convinced the Department of Neurology to let me spend three months at Queen Square in London. And, you know, I remember having lunch with Roger Bannister, who was at Queen Square. He told me this great story about it. He became a great runner. He said, during the war, they evacuated his family from London. And the area of England they were living was a bunch of bullies under a bridge. He learned to run fast, and now he's the first man to run the four-minute mile. Yeah. And all the giants of neurology were there, and I think I learned a lot about the clinical approach to neurology without overwhelming patients with studies. Wow. I can recall that you've been involved in uh, many book publications. You mentioned Wolf and 
upcoming, and we're a senior author or editor in most. Uh, tell me about the process of creating books for neurology and headache, and the most important thing about using books in this century. Will they be replaced? I think books will never be replaced. I think whether they're online or whether they're actually on paper will be an issue in the future. But I think there's a difference between a book, a chapter, and an article. Mm -hmm. A book is providing a message, it's a providing approach by the senior authors to a general topic, and it carries with it a philosophy, and it's uniformly created by that philosophy, and what it does, it provides somebody entering the field or even the field an update for what the thinking was at the time the book was written. You know, it's very interesting because now they have these online books. You can Correct. download most of the books that you've written, and it's kind of fun because you can highlight a word. It'll take you to the Internet. You can look up what Correct. it means. And uh, so books, despite being on the, the Internet, are still going to be extremely important for the future of doctors and headache specialists. I think there's nothing like a good book, whether it's a novel or something in medicine, and whether it's you prefer something online something on your Kindle or something you can actually yeah. hold in your hands is probably a preference and depends on how old you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well us bibliophiles are getting a little bit older by the day. Uh, tell me, uh, you've described many clinical entities uh, with your, yourself and colleagues and you expanded our knowledge of headache throughout your career. You also are a major contributor to guidelines including AHS, AAN and beyond. Can you discuss the importance of guideline de development for us so that the audience or future generations can maybe understand the concept behind it? Sure. I think one of the problems we have is there are a lot of different papers saying different things about different drugs. How is a physician one going to go to one source to tell you and give you evidence about how safe and effective they are and what all a guideline does is look at the literature on a particular drug or treatment, looks at the quality of the evidence, analyzes it, and tabulates it for you. So you can tell instantly whether the drug you're using is used based on well-designed clinical trials mm -hmm. or anecdotally. And that's important because, one, it'll get you better insurance coverage, but more important, you know it's safe and effective for your patients. But the old adage is the absence of evidence does not prove that yeah. doesn't work, but at least if you look at drugs in a class, you can get an idea of what other drugs in the class might work for you. How do you instruct your fellows and residents to use guidelines in a setting where the patient doesn't typically fall into the guideline uh, box and therefore they have to sort of translate it from the, the group data to the individual? I think what the guidelines will tell you is the following. In a well-controlled population, does the drug work? and a large number of patients is if it's safe. Mm -hmm. So based on the safety and the effectiveness in that population, we then take and try to translate that information into our individual patients. It's not a tell you, a guideline is basically it's something to guide you to patient care. It's not authoritarian. It's more something that prods you along and helps you make better decisions. You've also done a lot with clinical and therapeutic approaches to headache and including a modification of the famous Raskin protocol. I think you did this locally. And the consensus statement on chronic headache diagnosis and treatments. Can you enlighten us about this protocol, this famous DHE protocol, and how it was used and continues to be used today and maybe in the future? Despite the fact we have new medications that act similar, like triptans and now the monoclonal yeah. antibodies, DHE still seems to have an important role to play in the management of headache patients. It does. And I think it, people want pure drugs with limited side effects, with specific targets. And I think there's some time advantage to use a medication that has multiple means of action. Very simplistically, it's rare to get medication overuse or rebound headache with DHA yes. compared to triptans. The recurrence rate is lower. So if you have a patient who's taking lots of medicine, is overusing them, how do you break the cycle? And one of the mainstays of treatment has been the use of giving repetitive intravenous DHA for three or four days. And we've actually 
published the first long series of hundreds of patients showing remarkably good outcomes from the modification of the Raskin protocol. Do you continue on its use after the three or four days? Do you give a occasional dose? or? Uh, depends on the patient. Yes. We might taper it down. And we used to be able to give a lot more DHA to the patients afterward, but because of the fact that it's become prohibitively expensive, we're actually anxiously awaiting the arrival of cheaper nasal formulations of DHA. It looks like down the line there may be other options as well. I agree with you 100%. And okay. if you look at it, we're in error. Where we're continuing to take the basic knowledge we've had for years and converting that basic knowledge and information into new therapeutics. Okay. I'm going to go to cluster headache. I know that migraine takes over basically what we do almost yeah. every day. And, and the variations on it, but cluster is unique uh, in my, in my uh, career and in yours as well. It's remarkable and can be extremely difficult to treat. I used to tell the residents it was the pulmonary edema of the headache field. Uh, the real therapeutic options that are available to get the patient, individual patient through such an episode, chronic or relapsing or acute, can be rather uh, difficult for the clinician and even more difficult for the patient. I'm sure you've seen your share of these unique cases in your practice. Any comments on this group of disorders called TACs or trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias? Are we trying to split it up too much? Should we just say they're mainly cluster with little variations? I think the advantage of looking at this variation is the fact that one may blend into the other. You have cluster headaches where the attacks are an hour to an hour and a half. Then you have paroxysmal disorders like hemicrania, yeah. where the attacks are shorter, yes. and they go from down to sunk and sooner. And the question you're really asking yourself is, the reason for keeping them in a group, it makes you think of a group of disorders that are paroxysmal, relatively short-acting, compared from an hour to, to seconds, and that the difference is it makes you think about what they are, what they're associated with, and how to treat them. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I used to tease the residents say that there were ticks, tacks, and toes. For the ticks would be the neuralgias, the tacks would be the cluster-like headaches, and the toes I made up trigeminally originating events and called that migraine. Anyway, it still remains one of the most fascinating of neurological disorders. Uh, how important is teaching doctors about headache? Because I know over the year you've trained lots of physicians. We saw many of them in the audience yesterday. And when we have our new annual residence course, a lot of them here, the last time we had it in Philadelphia, stood up and you know talked about the way you trained them and how things went here. Um, any thoughts regarding teaching? As it now appears that technology is taking the place of traditional diagnostic approaches. An interesting point. I remember when they before the CAT scan, and we used to have to do pneumoencephalograms. Yes, I recall. And if you think about it, everybody saw the CAT scan would eliminate the teaching of neurology. Then came the MRIs and the imaging. The point is, you do a test for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is defined by the history and the physical. Then you know what you're looking for. Too often, people throw out a blanket of tests and then try to figure out what the results mean, when the question is really, what do you think the patient has and what do you need to diagnose it? Yeah, but the tests do help with localization, which our traditional methods have not always been as good, but you're, there, you see them as an extension of the history and physical and absolutely yeah. necessary. The less you know what you're doing, the greater the risk the test will give you false positives. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I want to uh, move on to congratulate you on your leadership here at Jefferson and being the director of the Headache Clinic. Uh, what is your view on headache clinic centers versus practice, maybe by an individual neurologist? Because a lot of people in this country and around the world are treated by their family doctor, a neurologist who has an interest in headache, or maybe even a headache specialist who works almost on their own. Now in America, of course, we're seeing large headache centers develop. You've had probably one of the biggest ones in the world. And what's your view on how we should translate the kind of knowledge we get at our meetings and clinical 
things into helping out the headache patient at the interface, they call it now. I think the fundamental issue is the fact that there's not enough headache doctors out there. Mm -hmm. And those of us who have trained in the field cannot take care of all the patients. Mm -hmm. There has to be a mechanism where there's a standardized approach for both doctors and patients to get the auxiliary help that even headache centers, individual physicians don't have available to them to create a site where they can learn about diagnosis, about treatment, if they're getting a drug from the doctor, and perhaps even a call center that can be used for everybody yeah. for 24-7 care who could then contact the physician. What's the most important thing you tell residents if you think they show some interest in headache? Because I see that you've been able to select residents or, or encourage people to go into the field where you know, in the old days, they might have gone into stroke or multiple sclerosis or movement disorders. What sort of things do you say to them that brings them around to this most interesting of all neurological fields? I was in general neurological practice. Yeah. And I tell them, if you're a stroke doctor, you got fun and the rest of it's rehab. If uh -huh. it's a brain tumor, you watch your patient die, and that broke my heart. If it's multiple sclerosis, you watch them slowly deteriorate and I never forget making house calls to a patient with ALS and watching them go under. This, this perhaps, is in a, only except for perhaps epilepsy, is one of the few neurological disorders which are disabling, which can be controlled, and in the name of what my patients tell me, we give them their life back. Yeah, well, there are some new things coming out for stroke. They're pretty drastic, some of them, and they have to be applied quickly without a lot of time to reflect. And there are some treatments for multiple sclerosis. But by and large, headache is a field where you can actually help people and restore them to some sense of normality. That is correct. Okay. So finally, in the past 30 years, we've seen remarkable advances in the field of headache medicine. Any thoughts on the future trajectories of therapies in the field? I ask you this because you've been a leading investigator in numerous medication trials and now devices. I think you can look at this in several ways. What's the untrapped harvest of basic observations in the headache world? There's another neuropeptide called PACAP, which may be a target if the right antibody targeting it is developed. The other thing is cannabinoids. People have spent a lot of time looking at marijuana derivatives, but the body has its own cannabinoids. And if we can modify them and enhance the body's own endocannabinoids, it would enable us to do what the cannabinoids do without the side effects. They're anti-inflammatory, they're antinociceptive. So the question is going to be, can we target the enzymes that break down endogenous endocannabinoids? And what about devices? There's so many devices okay. out there. They seem to help some people, but... I don't know anything at all in the headache world that works 100% of the time. For sure. <laughs> and with devices, the most of them have different mechanisms. Yes. So I think we now have a non-drug alternative as an adjunct or alone in patients. And the qu fundamental problem is getting them paid for. I think they're not more widely used because of the fact of lack of insurance reimbursement. Something in the therapeutic toolbox to call upon exactly. where you could spare a drug or exactly. have somebody be or somebody's pregnant or yep. breastfeeding, yep. Something, or if you're somewhere and you don't want the side effects of the acute medication. Any final comments, any high level, generic? You know what's funny? When I started Headache, I was laughing stock. People used to say, you do Headache? <laughs> You'll recall on a trip that we had to the Japanese Headache Society once the International Congress right. A few of us, uh, Dr. Lipton, yourself, yeah. Dr. Dodik, and myself, went down to NARA. Right. And uh, the lady who was the guide said, well, what are you here for? And we said, we're at a headache meeting, and she laughed. I don't think anybody's laughing anymore. No. Huh? No. And, you know, we're treating the person, right? I always believe the migraine explained to us how the brain works. I agree. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating disorder. And uh, I want to thank you very much for coming along and sharing your views and opinions on this and congratulations on everything you've done here in Philadelphia because many years after we're gone there'll be a lot of doctors walking around doing headache and they'll probably question why would anybody
think otherwise. You're absolutely right. Take care. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming. My pleasure.